Good afternoon, New Vine. It's a privilege and an honor to be here. This morning, I preach at the San Jose campus. Uh, last week, Kelvin said he was the substitute teacher, and I feel like today I'm the second substitute teacher. <laughs> but this afternoon, you are getting the less freak out version 2.0, because I was freaked out in, in the San Jose campus. So it should be a little bit better. Um, how many of you remember the first day of sheltering in place? Can I see a show of hand? OK. What date was that? <laughs> a lot of March dates. But the official date was March 19, 2020, three years ago. California Governor Newsom declare the first statewide order in the United States that require all residents to remain in their home except for engaging in essential activities. In that same year, the Bible app UVerse saw searches increase by 80%, over eight, 600 million searches worldwide. And guess what was the most popular Bible verse search? Any guess? Psalm 23, that's a good one. John 3.16, another good one. Can you see the Bible verse? Isaiah 41.10, please read together with me. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. So at the beginning of the pandemic, we were all living under constant fear and stress. We had no idea whether we were going to be the next one to get sick. For many, death of coronavirus hit close to home. We all knew of someone, perhaps a friend, a neighbor, or even a family member who passed away because of COVID. Three years later, by God's grace, today we're all here. Gone are the days of isolation. No need to stock up on toilet papers and don't have to wait in long lines six feet apart just to get our vaccine. The best part is all the students are back in school and the parents are so relieved. No more online learning. We're all back to a new normal way of living. No longer threatened by the virus. But that doesn't mean our life is not, our life is no longer, come again. Okay, that doesn't mean our life is now completely stress-free or no more fear. In fact, we're always surrounded by fear. Fear for our future. If you are a high school student, now is the time waiting nervously for the acceptance from the college of your choice. With all the layoffs recently, many are fearful of their employment. Fear of poor health, poor health for those who are growing older. Fear of more banks collapsing after two banks collapse within a week. Fear can be so overwhelming and debilitating that sometimes we are paralyzed by it. This morning, we're going to, not this morning, see my notes. This afternoon, we're going to take a look at the life of Gideon and see how God transformed him from a weak and fearful person into a mighty warrior. The sermon title is Weaklings to Warriors. Where's Lawrence? Lawrence, this is not about the Golden State Warriors. I'm sorry to disappoint you. Here's a little bit of background on the book of Judges. Joshua led the Israelites into the Promised Land, but the conquest was not complete. During the period of the Judges, which lasted about 350 years, Israel had no king, no leader, but they had God. Yet, at the necessary and appropriate times, God brought forth a leader for the nation. For the most part, these leaders 
who were called judges, would rise up, do their job, and then return to obscurity. There was a cycle of sin pattern in the book of Judges. At the top, you'll see, whenever the Israelites follow God, they, they will serve him and they will have peace. But as the years go on, they start worshiping other gods and idols and start leaving the Lord. Because of that, they will get into oppression and slavery and suffering. And when they go through that scenario, they will cry out to God and repent of their sins. God, in his mercy, will hear their cry and bring deliverance through a judge. Then the cycle will start all over again. There was a period of 40 years of peace after Deborah, the judge, delivered the Israelites. Then the people fell again into their evil ways. Judges chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. This is where we pick up the story for today, today's sermon. The Israelite did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord handed them over to Midian seven years. They oppressed Israel. The Midianites were very powerful. They treated the Israelites really poorly. The Israelites tried to hide from them by living in the caves and clefts in the mountains. Every year, the Israelites planted their crops, but then the Midianites will come in and destroy all their crops. There were so many Midianites that no one could count them. The Midianites were like a swamp of locusts because they ravage everything in their path. They kill all the animals. They destroy nearly everything. This was very difficult for the Israelites to survive. They didn't have food to eat and no animals to work their land. So what did they do in their oppression? They cry out to the Lord. When they cry out to the Lord, God sent a prophet, not a judge. He sent a prophet. The prophet reminded them how, how they were brought out of Egypt and the amazing things that God did in their lives by letting them conquer their enemies in Canaan. The prophet also reminded them that they didn't listen to God's warning about not worshiping idols. After the prophet, then God sent an angel of the Lord. Verse 11. The angel of the Lord came, and he sat under the oak that was in Oprah, which belonged to Joash, the Abyssalite. His son Gideon was threshing wheat in the wine vet in order to hide it from the Midianites. Wheat was normally threshed in a designated space in a designated space called the threshing floor. Threshing floors were hard, open spaces prepared on either rock or clay and carefully chosen for maximum wind exposure. This allowed the wind to blow the chaff away as the grain was tossed into the air together with the chaff, leaving the actual grain on the ground. Threshing floors were no hiding places. They were visible places. Wine presses were the opposite. They were square or circular pits which were dug out of the ground. Gideon threshed out the wheat underground in a wine press, not on the exposed threshing floor. Why underground? so that he could hide from the prying eyes of his enemies who were ready to confiscate whatever wheat that he had. While Gideon was hiding, and we're going to read this verse together, then the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Can you turn to someone and say, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Gideon was very puzzled and confused by what the angel of the Lord said. He was scratching his head 
and thinking, who are you talking to? Mighty warrior? The word warrior in the original text means to be strong, accomplish, excel, prevail. The root word is commonly associated with warfare and has to do with the strength and vitality of the successful warrior. It sounds a little funny to greet Gideon as a mighty warrior because he was laying low so that nobody could find him. However, God saw Gideon what, for what he would become, not for what he was at. God recognizes Gideon. In Gideon, something that Gideon does not even see himself. God has a way of seeing beyond our fears and frailty. He begins with us where we are, be, in the, be it in the wine press or whatever position we're in. He knows our weaknesses, our faults, our shortcomings, but he doesn't say, get your act together before I can use you. While others look at us and see our flaws and failings, God looks at us and sees our possibilities and our potential. He takes our inadequacy and transform it into his adequacy. God sees us for what we can become as he works in our lives. He is in the business of taking the ordinary people like you and me and transforming us through the work of the Holy Spirit into his mighty warrior. Gideon was definitely not feeling mighty. He was afraid, he was hiding, and he was not threshing wheat the way he should be. Fear held Gideon back. Fear kept Gideon in the wine press. He couldn't imagine getting out of the wine press and being on the open space of the threshing floor. Last summer, I was teaching my granddaughter to swim. We were both in the swimming pool together. She was by the side of the pool, holding on tightly to the ledge. I was about four feet away from her. And I told her, I said, swim to me. Swim to Papa, which is grandmother in Cantonese. And she was like, and I went back and forth. I'm right here. I'm not going to go anywhere. You can swim. Come on. So finally, after convincing her, she let go of the ledge and started flapping and kicking and swam toward me. I stood there and held out my hand and pulled her in and embraced her, and she was safe. Originally, when she was grabbing onto the ledge, she wasn't sure if I was going to grab her. She was afraid, and she was thinking that maybe I would, drown, I would drown if I don't get there. But I was there, ready to pull her in and give her safety. We can all identify with my granddaughter. She was holding to the ledge, not willing to let go, because she was afraid. Only when she finally let go, that was the beginning of her learning how to swim. Without letting go, there was no moving forward. Six months later, last December, she was swimming without the floaties in a pool in Bali, Indonesia, on a very nice warm day while I was freezing cold in the South Bay. God patiently waits for us to let go, to trust him, to catch us, even when we feel like we're drowning in deep water. We must stop looking at ourselves and start looking to God in faith. With his transformative power, he will lead us out of fear into becoming a mighty warrior. Verse 14, the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Another very strange thing for the Lord to say, go in the strength you have. What strength? Gideon was thinking, you want me to save the entire Israelite 
from the medians. But how? Do you know that my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family? Gideon had a lot of reasons why he was not the right candidate for the job. Remember Moses? When God asked him to lead his people out of Egypt, Moses' response was, I don't talk well. I've never been good with words. I stutter and stammer. Moses said, Lord, I beg you, send someone, not me. Similarly, when God told Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I pointed you a prophet to the nations. What was Jeremiah's response? I don't know how to speak. I'm too young. It really doesn't matter to God whether we are the weakest, the least, eloquent or not, too young or too old. What matters is that we trust him completely and willing to do even the most seemingly ridiculous thing. Verse 16, the Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. I can see God looking straight into Gideon's eyes and saying to him, Gideon, I am going to the battle with you. You're not doing this alone. I'm not going to let you go by yourself. I'm going to work it. I'm going to do it through you. You get it? Gideon is slowly beginning to see the picture now. The battle is not about his ability or what he can do or can't do. The battle belongs to the Lord. It is all about God. God will manifest his power through Gideon's weaknesses. But Gideon is very human, and he wanted a proof from the Lord. So he told the angel of the Lord, stay here. I'm going to prepare something and bring it back to you. So he went and got some meat and made some bread and brought it and presented it to the angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord said, put it on this rock, the meat and the bread, and pour the broth over it. Then he took a staff, using the tip of the staff, touched the rock, and fire came out and consumed everything. And then the angel of the Lord disappeared. And now Gideon is like, oh my goodness, what just happened? The angel of the Lord is gone. That was truly God. But God told him, peace, do not be afraid. You're not going to die just because you saw me. You would think after this encounter, after Gideon asked the Lord for proof that he is ready to go to battle. But no, if you read on, Gideon said again, if you will save Israel by my hand as you have promised, can I just do this little confirmation test? I'm going to put wool fleece on the ground and make sure that everything surrounding the fleece is dry but the fleece will be wet, and God did it. The next morning when Gideon woke up, the fleece was not only just moist, he was able to squeeze a bowl of water so that there will be no mistake for Gideon to know that God did it. So now Gideon should be ready, right, to go to the battle. No. He said, okay, don't get angry at me. Can I just reverse this and make sure it is you that is sending me? So this time, he wanted God to make the fleece dry and the ground around it to be all wet. Again, God did it. Everything was dry, was wet around the fleece, but the fleece was dry. If you read on in Judges 6, 7, and 8, you'll find out that Gideon led an army of 300 against 135,000 Midianites. For the engineers out there, the ratio was 1 to 450. The odds were stacked against them. 
But they won the battle. How did they win? By blowing trumpets, breaking jars, and shouting. A very unconventional battle strategy. They didn't even have to raise a sword. God's ways are higher than our ways. When Gideon was threshing the wheat in the wine press, he probably never imagined himself leading an army to fight against the very powerful Midianites. God is in the business of doing the impossible, the incredible, the unimaginable things in our lives if we allow him. He transformed Gideon from a weakling, a fearful person, to a mighty warrior. He can do that in you and in me. During the pandemic, a lot of us picked up new hobbies, some good, some bad. People learned how to cut their hair, bake breads, did gardening, try new recipe, and some binge on Netflix for hours. One of the questions discussed among the staff was how are we to live during this time of pandemic? What is God saying and what is he doing? How should we be using our time during this pandemic? I asked God what he wanted me to do and a thought came to me. I felt that God wanted me to share about my journey of losing of losing my husband. My husband was a pastor at the San Jose Church for over 10 years. He passed away in 2014 after a year of battling a very complicated disease. His death was very unexpected because he was healthy and relatively young in his early 60s. And this picture was taken the year before he passed away. The one in the white shirt is my husband and our five children and my son-in-law at the time. And death was very real and near at the beginning of the pandemic because many people were dying all over the world. I really didn't want to entertain the thought of sharing my journey. I told God, why me? I don't want to do this because it is painful and hard. But God kept on impressing in me. He said, not everyone has gone through what you have gone through. And even if they have, they have gone through of losing a loved one, not everyone is willing to share their journey. I'm giving you an opportunity to help others to ponder about death and the loss of a loved one. Are you willing? I knew God was right because God is always right. Finally, I gave in. I said, yes. After a couple of months of struggling through my thoughts, sorting out what I should focus on, I titled my sharing, Ready and Prepared. I was really afraid to share this with people because I didn't know how they would react. This topic is definitely not popular or a favorite topic for conversation. Most people don't feel comfortable to think about death or talk about it, but it is very necessary and very important. It took a lot of courage on my part to invite people to discuss this topic. I began meeting people in their backyard and sometimes in my backyard to talk about how to be ready and prepare to face death, whether it is our own or our loved ones. Having gone through this myself, I learned that to live well means to die well. What does that look like? To me, to die well means I'm ready to see Jesus, whether it is today, tomorrow, or in the years to come. It means that I need to make preparations in all areas of my life, be it spiritual, financial, relational, physical, or emotional. There's an ongoing conversation openly discussing 
the topic of death between me and my loved ones. The end goal is that I have no fear of facing death nor facing the death of a loved one. I can live fully because I have prepared to die well with no regrets. This assignment from the Lord was a hard one, but one that I knew I needed to accept. In the process of sharing my story, I have received a lot of healing, and I hope that those who went through this discussion with me were helped. The more I share, the less fear I have about people's reaction. God is still transforming, transforming me, and today I'm more courageous to do what he is calling me to do. I want to invite Angus to come and play the music. And the last Bible verse we'll read is from Deuteronomy 31.6. Be strong and courageous. Don't be terrified or afraid of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Are you hesitant or reluctant to face the challenges in your life because you're afraid? Do you feel like Gideon, only seeing your weaknesses and can't see what God sees in you? God begins with us where we are. Are you still hiding in the wine press when you know you should be on the threshing floor? Spend a minute or two to ask God what is one or two areas in your life that you are afraid to step out of. God promises to be present with you, to fight your battle with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. Step out from fear into victory at his mighty warrior. So please spend a minute or so, and then after you finish, I would like you to gather with two or three people and pray over each other. invite you to pray with another person or gather in a group and ask God to help you to step out of fear
understanding us as who we are. Thank you for walking with us, especially when we are afraid and fearful. You will never leave us. You will never abandon us. We thank you for being patient with us. You take us as where we are, and you work with us. So we ask you to help us to be courageous, to be strong in you, to say yes to you, even when it means hard and difficult. So we thank you, Lord, that you are our God. You are present with us, and you go into the battle with us. We ask this in the powerful name of your Son Jesus Christ. Amen.